I can talk oh, now. Oh, I can talk. Yes. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Yes. Dungeons and Dragons: Siege, Warfare, and Fantasy Defense in Death. Um, that's our talk. How do you manage this? Brought to you by. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of here. <laughs> So, um, a little bit about us. Uh, so, I'm old and obsolete. Uh, yeah, Amigo S, D and D. That's my knowledge sort of stops there. Evan's the younger and smarter of the two of us, um, and uh, uh, he's not a people person. And I like to suck on guns. So that's yeah. Okay. Continue. Um, oh, well, so here we go. This is a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. We're going to learn some lessons from the past. Uh, networking, security, that's kind of what we're talking about. Try to, we're going to look at what we're doing now and try to forget about it because it's not working. Um, something about a bridge to the future, I forget that part. But we're going to try to, we're going to predict the future and we're not going to use a magic eight ball. Um, Follow the psychic. We're, we're actually going to tell you what. No, Evan's going to talk about the future because he knows. I have no idea. I'm still. I'm stuck in the past. And we're going to talk about ways to try to secure the future, which Evan knows. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the past real quick because we're going to sort of talk about how we got to where we are now. And you know, everything's a big full circle that repeats. And so, centralized computing. Any old mainframe users here? In uh, yeah. Sweet, okay, so some of you know, okay, so there were these big, large, shared resources. Yeah, yeah huge, yeah, information processing, number crunching, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay, dump terminals, who, who's that? Anyone still use them? They're awesome, okay. So dump terminals, yeah, they so 60s, 70s, big thing, really cool. Uh, then we had the smart terminals, yeah, in the 80s, like, uh, you know, the, the deck, VT series. VT 100 for the win. BT-52, 100, BT-200, yeah. okay. And, and so, you know, these were all of a sudden dump terminals that could do some local processing stuff. And that's, that was kind of cool, that was fun. But then we sort of moved to decentralized computing, right? So now um, we have like these, these personal computers, the computers, they, they became personal. Um, and so sort of forgetting about the economics involved. Let's just talk about the, the why they were developed. So there were kind of a, a, a reaction to the frames. The, as my brother once said, the individualized punk rock to their centralized disco. And, and it, they were symbols of power and individuality and freedom because all of a sudden you now had control of configuration and all the applications that ran. And you could do it all locally. You had control. And that was really, really cool because you, could, you didn't have to rely on any kind of external system. Um, super fast computers. I mean, we had, and you know, we're talking, you know, kilobytes of RAM and endless megabytes of storage. What else? Would you need more? I don't think so. So that was a really cool sort of paradigm shift. I just like saying paradigm shift. Okay. Um, so and with you know decentralized computing, the files are inside the computer. Um, the computer. So now talk about where we are today, which is decentralized computing, which is a term I made up. Um, so we are through the traditional PC, um, you know, writing things in basic and saving on a cassette tape drive, at least some people did and I still do. But so you had the internet revolution. So that paved the way for all these incredible networking technologies, which increased networking speed. I mean, now remote sort of uh, remote Files, remote resource, everything. It, it blurred the line between local. I mean, all of a sudden, it was easier to find stuff on the internet, at least for me, than my local hard drive. And it's, uh, you know, it's like, ah, where did I store that porn? Or it's, it's like I, I'll just boom, and I can find it faster. It's, but it, that's because I'm kind of disorganized naming uh, system. But so then you got, well, yeah, you got um, cloud computing, and then. That's all these as a signal, fill in the blank, as a service. And you had all these platforms, like you do all kinds of cool stuff, and then you had, and I'm done. Okay. Uh, and what does DMD or C4 have to do with I, I don't know, but I was so excited to talk about Dungeons and Dragons 
and it's not about that. So, um, all right, and it's going to talk about some more interesting, relevant stuff. So, go for it. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, um, a chronologically incorrect timeline of, of stuff, which is this process of warfare and, and what can we learn from the past to the future and all that good stuff. And you know, the, the big deal is that you know, sword beats clubs and you know, walls beat whatever. And you know, by the time you get around, you've got this, you know, holy hand grenade and, and uh, random ninja dude with a computer. Uh, but, but the whole purpose of this and, and kind of the goal and, and, and the talk is to kind of look at this aspect of the escalation of warfare and, and the advances in armaments and how we can kind of do a little fantasy prediction into the future based off of all the stuff we learned from the past. So if we take warfare, we hear that word warfare get thrown out all the time. Uh, you know, if this is war, then why are, where's our strategy? What did we, what did we learn? So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny because what changed in this process at some point, we, we learned things that became more important to us, like, uh, you know, the other guy has a bigger gun or something like that. And so this, this shift happened into how do we, um, you know, how do we predict the next piece? Like, what's the next assault going to happen? So if I can predict it, I can get ahead of it, things like that. So intelligence, there was this shift into intelligence that became very key in how do we do the operational, strategic, the tactical advantages and things like that. And then we saw things like the enigma, you know, breaking the enigma code and things like that that just drastically changed uh, how what this, you know, the process of World War II happened and ultimately impacted, you know, the outcome of war. And so we see this importance now. So we say we're in cyber war, like what's an example of, of you know, what's really happening? This is the perfect example. I mean, the F-22 fighter, anybody know what that thing is? I, I know it's a plane, I have no idea what it does. Um, but, but yeah, it blows stuff up, um, which is cool, I guess. But, but this perfect example of intelligence being paramount to mitigating threats and the power that it has to, um, you know, help you defeat your enemies and that type of stuff. But, you know, where were the techniques to root out the spies that, you know, that we saw in this? Where was, we've, we've got all these perfect examples of playing in October and this, this shift in importance of intelligence and learning ahead of things. And so, you know, then we, everybody's still on the same page, we're still tracking, tracking, all right, cool. Um, because we're in the danger zone. Archer, Archer fans here? No? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so let's forget the present, I guess. I, that was, uh, try to forget it anyways, like what we're doing now, because arguably some of it works, some of it doesn't. Um, but but would you agree, like, there, we have no security problems right now at all, that's why we're here right now. Simpleton fool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so, so kind of setting the stage for this next little piece, because we're going to play a little game called Fantasy Defense and Death, and it sucks, but it's funny anyways. And, uh, you know, but, but if you ask your CFO, they can tell you, right, like, as time goes on, security is going to stay, get better or stay the same and that as we increase and automate and buy more products and stuff, we just need to either throw money or time or whatever and that cost will go down and all that argument of crap. So, so admin, dude, we're going to play this game and we're going to set some context here and do a little role playing. Who likes to role play? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So, so we're, we're moving this along. We're going to look at a completely exaggerated and fictional example that has never happened before. And you, yeah. So, admin guys, we got admin guys in the room. No. Oh, okay. Security guys. Hopefully. Audience participation. Who's <laughs> totally ignoring me right now? All right, cool. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, so, while Edmund was kind of maybe drinking last night. I was the last one with the slide deck, and I put in a couple of um, new slides that he hasn't seen yet. Uh, okay. As long as you get the mess up. No, no, no. I didn't All mess right. up the one. Okay. No, just like just one. Okay. If my notes don't come up on the screen. It's going to get really ugly. Um, so you know, we we got this defense in depth, you know, admin guy comes in, or admin guy's protecting the network or whatever, security dude comes in, he's doing an audit or something like that. And this never happens, right? You've never had that as a security professional, never had that admin guy be like, I have a kick-ass network and you're never gonna get in. 
right? They, they, we never get in, like bad guys never hang on time. <laughs> he took off, I also noticed he took off like the next slide view, so I don't, it's kind of like a little fun with that. So, there we go, all right, so uh, down the rabbit hole we go. Um, this is where the D&D comes in, right? I've got my plus eight firewall. <laughs> He's defending my network, and I have my arsenal of stuff, and I've got my wizard sim appliance, and he gives me plus five powers of divination or something like that. And, you know, and even if Security Dude does get past all of this stuff, you know, I'm going to be there. None shall pass. <laughs> then I've got my evil money, and he's going to gnaw your face off, and it's going to be unicorns and rainbow, you know, rainbows. And um, so, so let's let's be ready to play a game because I'm yeah. talking, yeah. right? So, uh, so so at, let's see. Admin dude's ready. Um, let's let's go. How, how do we play? Um, tower defense. Anybody love tower defense games? You know how to play? Yep. Cool. So so I'm not even going to talk about the inevitable. What happens in tower defense games? Like, we build our castle, and anyways, do you ever win? I, I don't know, okay, maybe you do. Yeah, so let's, let's gather our resources here. We've got all of our stuff in the, in the arsenal that we can choose from, but the, but the key point in this is we gotta choose our weapons carefully, right? We've got a lot of, uh, of fun stuff, and some of it's really expensive, but we have unlimited resources, and we never run out of, there is no thing as money, and, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I, I use buzzwords all the time to defend my network, and it keeps people out. I, I promise you that. Um, it works. Um, so, so we've got our resources, right? We're, we're, we're ready to go. Um, how do we, now we prepare for the siege, and, okay, good, you didn't mess with that. So, so we're, we're still playing the defense and death game, and, uh, but now, now you've got all that stuff, and you've never, like, tied your arm behind your back trying to manage all that, have you? Yeah, so I'm so busy configuring and monitoring all my stuff, my arm just fell off spontaneously. So, uh, um, ready? Let's, let's, let's play. Uh, so we've got our stuff. We're preparing for the siege. So, example number one. All right, this is round number one. Uh, have anybody heard of fishing? I, I heard I just became aware of this marvelous <laughs> new uh, attack methodology. Because we've learned here that this this works, right? It's uh, um, they're, they're never going to get through all of that stuff with an email. Like that's just so inconceivable. Yeah. But 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 that's a bad example, and so we're going to like go on to the next one, which is not that. But, um, <laughs> so so the next iteration of the fishing example, right? You know, the next iteration of fishing example is like the thirsty developer and the watering hole attack, right? So. You know, so now we have the you know the guy going through and he, you know you go download a tool and because that tool is completely safe and trusted these guys in these Chinese forums they like they are so helpful and the Indian guys they love to give me code for free um, because it, anyways all right yeah so so Evan not the old example it's, but it still works right I mean, any testers in here pen testers does this still work for you guys in your organization so. So, uh, okay. um, we, we lose round one. Okay, this one didn't make it in there. Um, this is my favorite picture. <laughs> so, oh, yes. so, so, we're not losing any arms here, I'm sorry. No, you want to do the example? No. Did you put the dice in your mouth? No, you don't go. No, no, no. Okay, I'm hogging the bogey here, and he likes it. All right. Um, so, so slide number. The next example is you know admin and security dude. OSINT. Do we have any OSINT people in the room? Does anybody even know what the heck that means? Yes. Uh, yeah, they've got an awesome presentation on Noah and Sky on Sudden. Do you get the do thumb, key thumb? Yeah. So, so we're so thankful that users put all this information for us to, to break in, but we do not use the cloud organization. We have policy. We have taught our users not to click on stuff. Like, they, they know, right? And there comes this realization that, oh crap, our stuff is starting to leave the cloud, or going to the cloud, even though we don't use it as an organization. And it, yeah, you know, any, anybody who's seen a customer, like, finally make this realization in their head? Oh, yeah. 
here I was thinking this stuff was gonna kill. But Dropbox is so convenient. I'm still waiting on that mass suicide now. I can tell it's just you guys are like losing your pen. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. There's, there's porn on the internet. What's up? Porn? <laughs> <laughs> He's left handed. He's, he is left handed. Yes, left handed. <laughs> All right, here, moving on. So, so, does anybody, I mean, let's just come to the agreement. Like, we lost control of this stuff. We, it's there, it's being used. Um, like I said, we, we've got this policy that nobody's going to use cloud, nobody's going to use their personal device to check corporate email, and that we can stop them even if we had to, right? There's no way they can use their iPhone or whatever browser to access OWA. Um, because that's, you know, we give them all blackberries. So, um, uh, uh, haha, that's it. So, game over. There's the game over. Um, you know, it's this, you know, all the stuff that we've done, it's like reactionary, right? We, we put devices in place that try to protect no, against known attacks and things that we think might happen and all that good stuff. But where, where do we change our focus to get off? All right. Moving on. Um, protecting devices, keeping people out, that good stuff. Like, we have to learn to anticipate and expect breaches and you know, control them. He <laughs> <laughs> put those dirty dice up on me. Um, so, I keep having to check, like, is what's here really up there? Because I don't know what it is. Um, this, this prevention is fuel. Uh, there's a little organization called Gardner, and, and the, even the troglodytes of Gardner understand that, uh, that that prevention is fuel, and they're, ex they're you know this concept of continuous compromise and financially motivated attacks. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the talk here. I can take it this one time. Okay. Uh, so if we, if we listen to vendors, we we this that's not going to happen. Right? We are in control because we bought their product. And you know, we didn't just DOS ourselves by buying a bunch of stuff and now we're trying to configure it. So, so if you're here, anybody planning on going and seeing a talk on any of these things on this, on, up here right now, like active defense, you know, collaborative defenses, those types of things, this is not a talk about that, so don't worry, I'm not gonna bore the life out of you. Um, but, uh, you know, Sun Tzu says no, you're gonna need blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so all of that stuff is really about like returning fire, right? We, we want to attack them back and, uh, yeah. Sweet, it worked. So, <laughs> you know, philosophically though, what we've just been talking about is, so we're following this, this progression of loosely strung together insanity and, and stupidity on our part of the, that philosophically we're fighting a battle that it's not going to end and there's not really a way to win it. It's just about continuing on, right? So so now we're ready to uh, like pull out the magic eight ball and predict the future, maybe. So you're going to... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I forgot. Part. This too. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, I do that. I'm, I'm turning my phone on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Pervasive computing, ubiquitous computing. Who's heard of that? Like yeah. two people, three people? Nobody. Okay. Oh, okay. Anyone using it? No, it's not out yet. No, no, I will. <laughs> so, no, pervasive ubiquitous computing. So that's that's like humans and computers are they're, they're the same ecosystem. They're directly interacting and affecting each other on this continuous basis, and and they're we're surrounded by all this telecommunication technology, and it's, there's a seamless integration of everything, data, services, and it's, it's going to be awesome, of course, not there yet. But um, two kind of principles, there's uh, context awareness, where the computers will actually understand sort of the, the situation in which the user, like, you know, is requesting information or services for it's the, the content, and will provide it accordingly, just magically. Um, natural interaction, so, Supplying services, what did I just do? I messed up, sorry. Um, now, so, concept of natural interaction. Supplying services or resources and information without the user having to like worry about how the computer's doing it. So it's not like, okay, uh, you know, my 
I'm going to open up a Google image search and uh, uh, to, you know, search for Gina Jameson. No, you just say, I want porn, and it just, that's the account. So it's just like that seamless interaction with what, yes, it's question. It's a little bunch of preferences, though, isn't it? Over time, I mean, it, yes. great you, system? Yes. Okay. No, irony for you would be, I want amputee porn. Yes, and so it, it sort of depends on... Uh, I know Nazi midget Eskimo. Uh, that, yes, that's... Uh, it called a porn star. That's a nice pack. No. Yeah. <laughs> Please do point out. <laughs> so that's that's the idea behind you know, sort of this pervasive ubiquitous computing, which is coming to a store soon. Um, well, now developing security for it. So we have this this um, inevitable pervasive computing platform, and, and it's it's going to happen. It's because we no longer sort of think of going to its place. A work is not a place you go to. It's a thing you do. Yes, I didn't want it. But no, it really, think about it, it's not. So th this whole sort of idea of, uh, of you know, sort of boundaries of, uh, you know, it's the, the network perimeter, this, you know, this, it's, not, it's now dynamically going to be changing, it's going to be eroding, it's, it's undefined. So um, trying to come up with a security architecture for a system like that is, it's a, that's a very difficult task to actually design and, and implement effectively. And of course, you know, as all products, we build security in from the beginning. It's not like an extra layer that we put on top, right? Right, right, right now. It's always, never an afterthought. It's always integrated. So we need to sort of think about how to do this now before, um, you know, the, uh, it's actually released to the public. This, uh, I think you can, I think you can do touring ubiquitous computing. But it's, I would, I would recommend it. Think about like uh, actually sort of the, in terms of uh, PC to user ratios. Like okay, uh, old school would be like one PC, one person, like kind of, right? Maybe, or maybe there. Now, what is it? Everyone has how many, how many computers, like, or connected devices, like what, you know? Cell phone, Nine, computer, ten. laptop, iPad, right? Apple Newton. I mean, they're all, you have many, so it's like one, two, N, where N is like a single digit. Then, with ubiquitous computing, you're gonna have like one to N, where N is in the double digit. So with this kind of, like, this scaling now, this, you know, it's, it's uh, exponential growth, or, or really, you know, steep linear growth, trying to scale the security architecture to fit that, traditional security methods aren't gonna work. We have to find a way to build it in at a, a fundal, core fundamental layer, which is something that Evan has done or figured out and is going to talk about right now. Go. All right. Jump in. All right. Check my slide again. It's all right. Okay. It's a Um. So, I guess here's the thing that just that kind of irks me a little bit as a security professional is this whole concept of um, that we can. Um, this, this, this idea that, you know, like right now it's all about like data loss prevention. How many organizations do you have that actually use this? I've seen a couple, and it sucks. It's all about keeping people from burning the CDs and things like that. So pretty pretty dumb in my opinion, but it's we're losing this battle, so, so why aren't we focusing on data protection? And, and the concept of ubiquitous computing and your data being everywhere and available all the time from whatever you're on and all that good stuff, like, it's you can't always enforce protection of the device or protection of the network or whatever it is. And so, as Noah said, we, we start to lose control of this uh, aspect of, of where data is and how we protect it. And, and do we even care about devices anymore? Is the information more important, like in the shift of information warfare, of warfare from traditional defenses into information based warfare and all this type of stuff? Is that progression? Are we, are we trying to scale in that, in that mindset? So, uh, when we take this concept of the, uh, there's this, the, the information security is a three-dimensional thing that it's based on multiple facets. And so if we, as the lines get blurred between devices and services and all that good stuff, yeah, anybody's mind like getting just completely warped trying to figure that thing out because it's very confusing. Um, thank you, a guy named McCumber for that one. Um, the, uh, the McCumber Cube. So I, yeah, we just said, but anyways, 
uh, if, if we stop thinking about it in, in the context of where our, our information is and that type of stuff. So like a lot of cloud storage, a lot of ubiquitous computing principles, things like that that we're using now, they kind of look like this. Like we have protection in transmission and maybe it's confidential in the transmission of it. It's We can keep integrity kind of around uh, this, this aspect of, you know, but integrity in, is, is more important in a lot of services now than, than security of transmission or processing and then availability starts to be limited because if we implement encryption on everything then we lose functionality for search or something like that. So how do we, how do we, it's this battle for resources not just in an aspect of the computing piece of it but from an information security aspect of how do we wrap our heads as security professionals around a three-dimensional issue which you know humans and technology maybe the technology can completely protect us but then that takes away or limits us in what we can do as far as availability or something like that so honestly i think this is the best we could ever probably hope to get to would be something like this because people are stupid and uh if you're not if you didn't figure that out yet um okay um so so how can we get as close to this as possible is kind of the goal so we're going to talk about uh, an idea that I had and went all beautiful lines all over a mirror in a hotel room a few weeks ago. Um, so, <laughs> surprise! One, cut a hole in the So, this is probably going to cut off, but, but here's a concept. So, you, the idea in ubiquitous computing and stuff like that is that we have this storing we mentioned earlier, this store anywhere, available everywhere, regardless of what OS or what device you're on. It's not advancing. Uh, this, that we want to use any algorithm that we can use. We don't want to lock ourselves into a particular encryption framework or algorithm, and that we want to. We shouldn't have to build entirely new methods of, of communications. We shouldn't have to wait for IPv10 to make this work or something. And that uh, what that says is support for multiple access control methodologies because the the framework it can be shifting, especially as we talk about like. Uh, You've got ABAC attribute-based control and all these different things that are coming out all the time that NIST and all those wonderful people come up with these great ways for us to like, wreck our networks. And can we incorporate something that's really big right now is incorporating trust into how we, into that context of how we interact with data and devices. Do I have a level, like, you see the CDSS scores and all that kind of stuff, that's about trust, right? How, how much security, how can I trust that that device is gonna get compromised? And some of the other things that, uh, that come into this are how do we protect the data and put it in the cloud without anybody, without disclosing what's inside of it. So we don't want to give our data to Google because they might do something with it, like sell it to everybody else. Or, um, no. Really? Uh, that, I'm predicting the future here, guys, all right? They may want to do that one day. Oh, that's it, yeah, prism. <laughs> So and then this, so like the next version of OS X Mavericks is going to have data tagging and all that good stuff, so that you have these new contexts that you can group files in, regardless of where they are in your operating system and things like that. So so obviously we're going to drink this magic potion, and we're going to have plus ten thousand to the power of my D and D security. Like a get points, let experience points. Because we never played. So, so uh, we're, we're searching for the Holy Grail, right? So we're, we're going to keep going. Um, so, so here's my idea, and, and this is probably going to take as much time until they hook me off the stage because it's a very complicated topic. And uh, but this, what if we had scalable profile PKI encryption designed for ubiquitous computing? So we're talking about the cloud here. The cloud is in the computer. Um, active access control. So the methodology for how access control of devices and services and things can change over time or can change in context to the policy or whatever it may be because we have we recognize that we're not hacked now but we might be hacked in five minutes and how do we you know, we, we anticipate a breach so how can we respond accordingly and then what if we had these aspects of file management because file management systems work so well now and, and possibly allow us to do data destruction through, with PKI, if we're doing this, like all we gotta do is destroy the private key, right? And then it's like useless, the data is gone. And you do this through certificate archiving or revocation, maybe we give data like an automatic kill switch, which is that if you're not happy, it's only got six weeks or whatever to be used and then it dies or something like that, this, this, this concept. Any, any 
tinkers here who's smoking the weed at this point. Um, I got some really good. Um, so I have no idea. So this is where the, the complexity kind of comes into this. All right, so, so we take it in context, we have, we have an app. And, uh, and so we're gonna go around this little slide here, and this is gonna take a minute to get through. So uh, um, hopefully there will be no mass suicide. It's very boring. Um, and uh, what not boring? Okay, can I get over here? Yeah, the so, so, so we have some of the protection mechanisms that we have for apps and devices currently um, involve certificate pinning, you know, ASLR, SE Hop, all these great things. So we're, we're relying on those things to help us protect our applications. We have all these other aspects of devices and things like that that are, that are being protected um, at, at different layers. So if we think about it from an OSI model, encryption is supposed to happen in the presentation layer, but the reality is that it's all over the place. It just depends on how the application developer decided to implement it and all that good stuff. So, but we, we sign our app with some type of a private key that identifies the individual that's running it. And if we create a, a security context for you know, users accessing the application, have some type of identity that they're logging in with, and, and right now we have the capability to give them public and private keys and all that good stuff, so that's not, we're, we're there at that point. And uh, so, so if we move forward, like the user interacts with the app in context to some identity that they've received either from Google or the cloud provider, or maybe it's from their domain or whatever it is, and they create a file. Everybody with me this one? Yep. All right, you suck, Evan. Um, so what if they, so we take this, we've got like, right now we've pretty much just described like PGP, right? Um, we, we interact with it, we encrypt this app, or encrypt this file with our, um, you know, with our keys and stuff. But what if instead of just encrypting the file, if we want security and transmission, we want those, those that magic holy grail stuff, how do we send data across networks without disclosing content? How do we protect our data so that I can be sure that the people that are get, that the person on the other end is the only one that can receive it? Because SSL and all those other ones, they have never been attacked. They are perfect. I hate you. Um, so what if we stop thinking about private, public private keys just for in the context of users and extended that out to, like we talked about applications, what if we extend it out to servers or services, and servers and services and all these types of things, they all get their own public private keys as well. Now we're not gonna get into how I do key management and all that stuff, yes, you can that as fast as you can. Um, or actually drink it very slowly so that I can, can't bother me anymore. Um, so this concept of like when we get into these more advanced active control, active access control mechanisms, they introduce this concept of a policy decision point server, which is what's making the decision on how your context or your interaction with files or OS is either. No, don't leave. Yeah, we suck. All right. Um, so, so then we, we send a file through, what if we encrypt the file with the public key of our domain, and the only person that can open that file is the domain, so maybe it's Google or whatever. Maybe we've encrypted parts of the content of that file, et cetera. But we send it down to a server and a policy decision point interacts with the data, identifies content, and maybe it's social security numbers. Maybe it's something that we want to protect. And the decision point server can interact with it and create contexts for how that data gets protected. Maybe it's only allowing certain users to interact with um, social security numbers. And so they have a role-based access control metric that, or role-based access piece that does that. So your identity server then has you know, attributes, you use role-based access control mechanisms, you have attributes that you're monitoring or, or preventing access to, things like that, and just different policy settings and what that little cop for. What if we give each of those their own set of public-private keys? And then they take that and they create, they add to the file. So now we have journaling, we have the context that we can, you know, that data can be segmented and, and partitioned away from others, and that if you do not reverse resolve those keys, if you're not a part of those groups and everything else, like perhaps that, that journal file and you can do mandatory access control and all that good stuff, I'm probably like, telling like, where did, how do you get to this from the stuff we were doing earlier? I honestly don't know. Um, this, yeah. So we, uh, we create this, this file in context and then we, we want to make sure that it's secure and encrypted all the way up to the, and that the only other person that can open it is maybe our cloud provider. So then we, again, take that file and the policy decision point can forward it out to the Dropbox or whoever else, 
and they're the only one that can open it because we've signed it with a public key infrastructure. So now it's in Dropbox's hands. And so now I can turn around and the cycle can continue that a user can uh, interact with their data through the app again and all that good stuff. So how does this scale? Uh, all those good things. Um, and I'm just glad that I got through that and most of you look like you're still alive. So um, I was worried for a bit. Um, so, so what does this, the content of this file look like exactly? Honestly, I have no idea because our testing is, it's been interesting. So if I can still have, because this is a journal file, I can still have portions of the document that are encrypted only for me under my identity and I'm the only one that can open. So I've now got an aspect of, you know, here that I can send that through to all these other servers and services, but the data that's important to me, I can keep private from them. So it's not limiting your availability of that file. It just restricts access to you. And then we journal other pieces of it. Maybe I have data that I want to share with another member of the organization so they can collaborate with me on the document. Again, those get signed and encrypted by maybe it's the you know, attribute public private key set that encrypts that. So then as I reverse resolve uh, that key cipher, if I'm, if I'm part of the organization, I have an identity that resolves that, then I can then open the file. So, and it allows us through journaling to add and add and add and add and all that good stuff. And so the integrity of the file can be maintained regardless of who touches it. I can build trust based off of who's touched the file, and what they've added, and what they may or may not have been able to see based on time and context. And then this gets kind of big after that. And, uh... <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It just can't see through that. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, Sir Grumpy Cap, he hates encryption, by the way. Um, I think we're doing okay on time here. but. Uh, it, it's a much bigger, the, the concept of this is, is much bigger, and, and we've actually outlined and diagram and done and, and started doing uh, some proof of concept of this, and, and the, the reason that we're coming and presenting something like this here is the, is the aspect of that it's not gonna work unless we create something standard yeah. that everybody would use. It's a framework, it's not meant to be a, um, it's not meant to be like in the next release of Microsoft, OS, whatever. Um, everybody has to use it, so our focus is focusing on data protection, not loss prevention, which is like the next cycle of products that you're going to have to buy um, because somebody told you that you had to. Um, so we're working on this, we're calling it presentation six and a half, presentation layer six and a half, for encrypting all the things. You'll not, you won't hear that again for the rest of the week at all. All the things. So, pentestfail.com. Uh, we break stuff and do stupid things and Noah sexually harasses me. Um, I have been like twice. So, yeah. are we good? <laughs> yeah. All right. Questions? Questions? Uh, lady Insults. over there. One. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, two part questions. How are you planning to monetize this and how are you planning to merchandise this? So, Does the box the have lights on it? No, I mean, that's the whole point, right? It, it kind of goes back to what I said. You're talking, talking to this thing. Get off. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, no, the, the aspect is exactly that. If, if we monetize this, we do something that nobody else is going to get to take advantage of it. So it, it's all about it being available to everybody, and it plugging in, having this presentation six and a half type of thing, plugging into because it has to be pervasive, right? How do we make it pervasive? How do we, uh, that's the challenge that we're facing right now. So there is no money involved in the development of this. It's all just me and a few buddies that, uh, um, I'll, I'll back up real quick. A special shout out to John Collins, who's coding a lot of this stuff. I, I had some slides in here on, like, on what we were doing, but we knew we weren't gonna have time to talk about every little bit of you know, the web ontology frameworks and things like that that we've actually used to build this stuff, or stuff we stole from IEEE that sucked, but we're going to use it anyways. Um, we don't want to write something new. We want to use existing stuff and stuff that's out there already because that's how we get mass adoption. That's how we get critical mass. And so we 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 don't have the code published up, but right now it's written in Java, Boo, Java, um, or Unicorn Boo, as I like to call it. Um, but that's just what we know, and we're hoping to open up the audience and open up the developer contributions. So if you've got skill set encryption and, and developing framework technologies that can be written in whatever language your iPhone wants to use next type of stuff, um, then please hit us up and join in.
terms of monetization, you notice uh, what we both yet? Uh, we work with Microsoft. Mi Microsoft? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't we don't work with yeah, we have these things say I don't know why you but I can make you one if you want. There, uh, we, that's, that's a, they have a great business model, and uh, we're going to follow what they've done in the past. So, secure software at a reasonable price. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I lost track of some structure. Yeah. Was there a thread pulled from there that turns out through? Well, the idea is that if, like, so if we talk about trust and that kind of stuff, so all I have to do is revoke the certificate of that file so it won't resolve anymore. So when it comes back, it, it, like I said, I know it's a really complex thing, but the idea is that the data that's, that's encrypted with that key is can no longer be unrendered you know, uh, theoretically, right? Because the, the certificate is no longer valid. So it's just like certificate revocation OCSP that you have now. You go to a site and it says this, this is you know, no good, but those private keys for context or users belong to them, so they're withheld. It's it's not like you can say, well, I will choose to resolve it anyways. It's to unencrypt it, you have to have the private key, and your policy decision point server holds it, and they can say, I'm not going to allow you to use it anymore. So that data effectively becomes unusable. Um, does that make sense? Question. Right. So you guys have red models in any way that I mean, if you're bringing policy machines and stuff, you just give them more of an attack surface. Play with it. The only thing that would, yes, you have more of an attack surface, but the only thing that it would do for you, I mean, you'd have to get, if you got all the private keys to everything, that would be what, you, what you'd attack. But it's no less complex than what we have now. I mean, it's, we're talking about, act, it's just like Active Directory. Think about PGP plus, Active Directory plus PGP in the most simplistic of terms. There are devices and, and beasts that you have to have out there already anyways. But neither, um, but neither of those are really that secure. So you're building a, a new interesting amount of something interesting, but you're doing it on a very deep foundation. Like it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's the, the idea too is, is that the only thing that I care about trusting anymore, I don't care about devices at this point, because I can build context based of devices based on attributes, and I can say I don't trust that device, therefore the data won't, I won't even allow that file to be released. So. I don't care, I'm gonna to have to rely at some point on, that's why it's, we call it six and a half, because it kind of, it has to sit at layer six and a half, or layer six for presentation layer security, so I'm gonna rely on application level protections like SE Hop and memory allocation, you know, stuff, and all that good stuff. I'm gonna rely on sandboxing and all that stuff because I can't fix that stuff, and I can't keep developers from, from using it, and I've gotta rely on lower level, lower level stuff, like in layer five for session control and the security mechanisms that they that can apply there, the, the reality is, is that there's this misconception, I think, by a lot of developers that layer six has to be yeah, I'm getting the hook. So we can talk about this offline. But uh, thank you very much. They'll, they'll, and they'll, they'll, we'll, they'll be releasing with the uh, Prism API. Uh, <laughs> so that would be helpful as well. Um, and the, the other thing is, uh, this is no substitute for homomorphic encryption, which um, anyone have any solutions for that? No. You said homomorphic. Homomorphic? That's not game encryption. No, it's homomorphic. No, it, you, you encrypt stuff and it stays encrypted. You the one funk it never gets decrypted. So it does, which is sort of the holding of where all the crypto, but that's, anyway. Okay, sorry. Someone buy you a beer and ask you that question. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the rambling, and if you are interested, stick around.